What's up guys? I'm Kay Scholl. Welcome to another financial awareness video. So today's pretty special. We're talking with a CPA about taxes. Had the opportunity of sitting down with Brennan, aka Budget Dog. I'll link his YouTube channel and other social media links down in the description below. And you know, among a few other things, we talked about preparing a checklist for your federal annual tax return. Talked a little bit about taxes for cryptos and NFTs. Had a little bit of a conversation around the dynamic of the relationship between a CPA and the client and what to expect from that relationship if you are a client working with a CPA. And then maybe a brief discussion about how CPAs or bookkeepers or accountants are paid, how they're compensated. So if you like this video, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and consider subscribing to Brennan's channel as well. You know, after we got done filming, I mean, we had a nice little chat together and I got to tell you, he is a sharp guy and a straight shooter. He's married with a little new young baby. He completely paid off all of his debt, including his primary home before he turned 30 years old and he just invested 30 grand in January. So he's a pretty sharp guy, somebody you're going to want to surround yourself with. So go ahead and give him a follow as well. So hope you enjoy the video. And if you do like it, we've got a couple other ones with Brennan coming out here soon. So hope you enjoy those as well. Enjoy the video. All right, so Brennan, it's tax season. What exactly would you suggest would be the best way for people to prepare for their taxes as someone who's maybe 1099, maybe they've got a small business or shoot, maybe they just are a W-2 employee and they've got some side hustle income and that kind of makes their tax return a little bit weird because it's not just their normal W-2. What would be some good tips for you to suggest to people in that situation? Yeah, so something, I'm going to speak from my experience actually. So when I used to live at home, my parents filed my taxes like a lot of 18 to 21 year olds. And finally you move out of the house and you have to learn it on your own. And you're like, where do I go? So the first thing I did when I moved out and I had to file my tax return the first time was I took a list, basically a checklist. I made my own checklist, but I didn't only just make it for that year and get rid of it. I kept it for the following year. So each and every year I knew with what I had to cover, I needed to get X, Y, and Z documents. So now as a self-employed individual, I know there's going to be more and more documents and there's different moves I've made throughout the year from a tax perspective, and I have to go collect everything. So I always run to my broker and I go to the tax document center. That's an, it's a very helpful place to go. You will see all the tax documents from your HSA, from your broker, um, any investments that you have, you'll have everything there. They organize and do a great job of doing that. Now, something I've come across recently is the crypto side of things, and that's becoming more popular with time. And I've gotten a number of questions. How do I do my taxes for crypto? And the number one thing to do is to get a tax tracker application and connect that tax tracker application like a coin tracker or Coinly and track it to or connect it to your all of your apps. Let's say you use Binance, um, Coin, Coinbase or whatever you use, Gemini. And then that will pull the tax information that you're going to need at the end of the year. And so if you if you do it by yourself, create your checklist and each and every year, it's always a fantastic idea just to keep that on hand. I have it personally in my phone that says I need X, Y, and Z for next year. And then every time it comes around January, late January, January 31st, I go attack all those documents. I typically save a folder of exactly where to go so it doesn't take me a bunch of time because it can get messy, especially if things change. If you have a CPA, a good CPA will send you a checklist each and every year before the, the before right before the year ends, likely, and they will tell you exactly where to go to get that. So that's always very helpful. I like lists. I like Excel as a CPA, and so that's what my the biggest piece of advice I could give you. That's fantastic, and I'm glad that you mentioned crypto because one of the things that I've noticed, and some people are already starting to talk about it because it's tax season would be whether or not you actually disposed and sold of some crypto, right? Because just for clarification, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but if somebody in the year 2021, right, last year, just bought crypto, right, and they didn't sell it, I don't believe they have to claim that, right? You only have to talk about crypto on your file uh, when you're federal, excuse me, when you're filing your federal tax return if you've actually sold it and whether you've taken a gain or a, a loss, right? Correct. It's it's really similar. I think a lot of people get crypto taxes all confused. It's really as simple as like 
how do we typically do our regular investments? If I were to go buy Apple stock on December 31st and I just held it, it went up in value, but I didn't, I didn't have a capital gain associated with it or capital or loss. If I sold it, let's say I did it on December 20th and I sold it December 28th. In that situation, I have a gain or a loss on that taxable event. But if it's in the next year or in the subsequent year, the year that in which you sell it is when it, the taxable event occurs. Realized gains versus unrealized gains. Pretty similar, right? Correct. Exactly. And, and something a lot of people don't understand is when they go to a lot of people are buying NFTs right now. Um, and not to get on a crypto and NFT tangent, but when people go to buy okay. those in a, NFTs or let's say they go purchase a service with Bitcoin or Ethereum, I have a few clients like, hey, can I buy, can I purchase a service with Bitcoin? I'm like, you can, but you're selling it essentially to make that transaction happen and you're getting taxed on that. So not only are you paying me, but now there's a tax associated with whatever, whatever that gain or loss was that you had. Very good. Now, one of the things that, I've tried to harp on a little bit throughout my channel is setting the right expectations. So we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit from crypto and NFTs and, you know, preparing for taxes. And we're going to start to talk about people's expectations in working with their CPA, right? So many times people think they're going to get a refund and then they go meet with their CPA and they realize, oh my gosh, now I owe money, right? So if you could just kind of generically elaborate a little bit about what you think somebody should be expecting when beginning to work, not maybe, uh, you know, with an experienced relationship between a, a CPA and their client, but maybe somebody that's starting out uh, working with a CPA for the first time, what would you say would be a good thing to have them uh, be setting their expectations in working with that CPA? Yeah. So have clear and concise agreement between the CPA and the client, because most times you have a CPA in their book filers or tax, you know, tax preparers, and that's about it. And they don't really have, a lot of CPAs don't have the personality. Um, and once they get your, your tax documents, they're going to file your return. They're not going to talk to you and they'll send it to you in the mail or email you and say, sign and date. Boom. And that's all. And that's all. And, and no one usually goes, a lot of them don't actually go into detail. So when you're looking for a good CPA, word of mouth is really, really important um, to see if somebody is going to engage. If you don't have a CPA, if you're not reaching out actively to a CPA, chances are they're not going to reach out back to you. So having somebody that engages with you is important and you might have to pay more to do that. But to understand what's going on with the tax situation of yourself, it, it's worth every penny in my, my book. So that's something that you should have the expectation of. Um, also, a good tip is if you are surprised, let's say you come to tax time and you're like, you know, you owe 2000 extra dollars and you thought, the biggest thing is planning and to making sure the next year you don't run into this debacle. The idea is to break even. We don't want to owe money and give Uncle Sam a refund or give a tax or interest free loan. And we also don't want to, uh, you know, get money back. Right. Um, or vice versa right there. But the, the key is really to break even. Right. We don't want to go e either way. And when that happens, what we could do is really adjust on our tax withholding at our W-2 employer each and every year to make sure that we do break even. And we can plan effectively with a good CPA that will help us get to that correct number because sometimes your employer is not going to withhold the correct amount. Awesome. In addition to that, I kind of just want to elaborate a little bit more on what you just said, because you mentioned CPA, you mentioned bookkeeper, right? Accountant, you know, very similar to the sense that you know, financial advisors sometimes have multiple titles. You could be a financial representative, a financial advisor, a wealth management advisor. You could be somebody who just does planning, somebody who just does insurance, but they call themselves a financial advisor. So in, in our industry, we have multiple titles, CPA, bookkeeper, accountant. Could you just take a minute and kind of just break down a little bit of how each of those uh, tax professionals is compensated because I think it's really helpful for the consumer to know what they're getting involved with. And I say that because in, in, in the financial advisor line of work, people don't really always fully understand how advisors get paid. And then the advisor makes a recommendation, which may or may not have an impact on that financial advisor's pocketbook. So, you know, if you could just take a moment and just elaborate a little bit on how CPAs get paid is it by the form? Is it monthly? Is it quarterly? Just kind of elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. So every CPA is going to have their, their own uh, 
uh, costs that, that they're going to charge a client, right? So every single CPA, whether it be bookkeeper or tax preparer specifically or CPA. So let's start, let's do all three, right? So bookkeeper is going to likely be a flat fee. They're going to do the books or the accounting work for your small business per se. Then you have tax preparer. This is somebody that's just going to prepare your taxes. Typically, this is built off of form, or this could be based on hourly hour, hourly rates. They typically build the hourly rates into the forms um, because they know how complicated each form is. And then you have CPA. And CPAs can kind of take it up a notch, right? They can actually do consultations. So they might base an hour of your time to plan for the next year um, at X rate, whether that be 250 or 1,000 or 2,500. It just depends um, how, much of, how much advice they're truly giving. They could also charge if a CPA is just doing you know, acting as a tax preparer, they might default back to the tax preparer rates of based on the form or based on the hourly rate. But CPAs kind of vary and there, there's different services they're going to provide. And as a result, the, the cost of those services are going to change. So I would imagine somebody that just does a federal or state tax return annually, I would assume that's probably by the form or a flat rate, right? And then there's a yes, and then there's a okay yeah that's why that's kind of what I thought and then there's got to be some sort of a a natural progressive progression transition of the small business owner or self -empl self employed persons uh, I guess tax world if you will when they go and transition from only working with a CPA on maybe say an annual basis to maybe working with a CPA maybe quarterly for payroll taxes or to help file that that uh, quarterly estimate tax bill. And then I would imagine also too, there's another level of progression where maybe a business takes on more employees or the business gets a little more complicated from a tax perspective or just shoot just the revenue growing in the business to where that small business owner or that self-employed person says, you know, I really should work with a CPA monthly. So, you know, we're not going to hold you to this at all, but again, just kind of generically take a moment and, and talk a little bit about maybe your opinion, if you will, on when somebody should consider taking those next steps and those progressions of hey, somebody that files, you know, annually, and that's really the a limited exposure to their CPA to then maybe quarterly to then maybe doing some sort of like a monthly bookkeeping service. So you could just, you know, we're not going to hold you to this, but just kind of elaborate a little bit about that. Sure. I think most people actually know inherently, like they know, they feel it in their gut when they need that, that help. They either don't know, they're confused, they have anxiety about what's going on. Numbers are running every single way and they just don't know. And so that's the time where you start to think, okay, maybe I need a CPA. And so from my progression of a basic 1040, you know, I might not need help. I might have a very basic, you know, married filing jointly situation. Then I start my small business and I'm like, okay, I can use QuickBooks um, and, you know, check and do some checks and balances there, make sure I'm within the right tax withholding and I'll probably be okay. But then maybe you add an employee, um, maybe you add 10 employees. And you're like, I don't know how to run payroll. Um, which business structure is the most effective for me? Am I supposed to be a sole proprietor? Am I supposed to be an S corp? Am I supposed to be a C corp? And from there, the gates open up. And it's like, there are so many different routes. Now, somebody that's in the business can really quickly ask a few questions and kind of point you to the right direction and then set you up effectively for the long run. But for somebody that's never looked at the books or never have, has taken an accounting class in the past, this is a foreign language to people. So at that point, when you have that confusion or you're like second guessing yourself, do not guess first off, uh, pay for the help and make sure that you're not in default with the IRS come, you know, two months down the road and they're sending you bills to your, to your room or to your house. Cause that's not a good idea. The IRS is the last creditor I want to piss off. <laughs> yeah, that's a fact. <laughs> Yeah. Sweet. All right, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, y'all. That was a great chat there with Brennan. Brennan, I just wanted to give people the opportunity of learning more from you. Where can people find you on social media, on YouTube, on Twitter, on wherever? Where can people get a hold of you? So uh, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, Budget Dog, and then Twitter and TikTok, Budget Dog underscore. I also have a blog and a podcast coming soon. So check me out there. And for all resources, just go to my link in my bio and any of the social medias, and you will find those all there.
beautiful. And I'll, I'll put all of your stuff in the description of this video as well. If anyone wants to click those links and find Brennan there as well, that'd be great. Well, hey, man, appreciate your time. I know that you are busy with Logan and with your wife. So thank you so much for your time. Really do appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to seeing it again, man. Appreciate it, Kyle.